Good morning. Welcome to Grace Christian Center. We're going to be in Luke 23. And uh, before I begin reading, I just want to touch base on what it is we're going to be talking about this morning. The title of the sermon is God's Not Dead. God's Not Dead. Amen. God's Not Dead. Amen. He's Not Dead. He is alive. He's alive in you. If you call yourself a believer of Jesus Christ, He is alive. Even to the unbelievers, He is alive. He is on His throne. He rules and He reigns. There is nothing, nothing, nothing that could catch Him by surprise. There is nothing that, that, that could confound Him, that could throw Him into confusion. God is on His throne. And everything is going to be just fine. Do you believe that this morning, church? Are you listening by video. Do you believe that this morning? There came a time... In the earth, where people thought that God just was dead, that God was not alive, that there was just, we were beyond hope. And it was like that when Jesus came upon the face of the earth. And I'm talking about Jesus Christ, the only Son of the living God. God manifested Himself into the flesh. Jesus, the Christ, the only Christ, the Messiah, the righteous one, the anointed one. This is the same Jesus that lives within you today, Christian. God's not dead. A lot of the world would say He's dead, He don't exist. But you know, just as we may not be able to see the wind, but we know it's there. We may not be able to see God, but we know God is there. And God loves you with a compassion. He loves you with a compassion. He's wanting to draw you into holiness and to godliness. He's wanting to draw you away from compromise, from oppression, from frustration, from sickness. Why? Because He created you. He breathed life into you. And it's the will of the Father that you know Him and that He know you. That your name be written in the Lamb's Book of Life. There came a time in history when Jesus came upon the face of the earth. And that's the way the Lord caught the world. They were asleep. They were, they were the, some, just a few, were looking the Messiah to come. But the religious establishment was asleep. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, that they had just turned a blind eye to the will of God, their plan of God. They had been silent for almost 400 years when Jesus Christ came. And people thought, God, is he, is he care? Is He there? Is He coming? Has He forgotten about us? Jesus came and He began to speak and He began to heal and He began to, to make things brand new just like He has done in your life for some of you. Jesus began to move in the hearts of people. He, he was taking the most perverse of sinners, liars, adulterers, fornicators, and He was transforming their lives just like today. The addicted, the homosexual, the sexually perverted, the sexually immoral, the, the, the drug addicts. He was taking them and He was cleansing them. He was transforming them. He's not dead. But we still had a small group of people, the Pharisees, that were looking at Him and saying, He is not the Messiah. We want Him dead. We want Him crucified. So through evil men, through the plan of Satan, and Satan thought that this was his greatest hour, this was his greatest day, when he had Jesus arrested. And when he put Jesus on that cross, Satan thought that he had won by killing the Son of the living God, the only Son of God. Satan thought that he had won, that there was victory, that he could now have the whole world bow before him. But just like you, my friend, when you think Satan has had his greatest day in your life, just like you, when you just feel like you're at your, your bottom's in, you've hit rock bottom, that's where you'll find God. That's where you'll find the plan of the Lord. That's when you'll find and realize that God's not dead. That He's been beside you, behind you, before you, this whole time. There's got to come to a point in the life of a Christian, there's got to come a point today where we have to stand up for our faith. Not be bullies, not be proud and boastful about it, but we need to stand up for our faith in the United States of America with compassion and with kindness, and say Jesus is alive. In Luke chapter 23, verse 33, they were leading Christ to the cross. 
And it seemed like it was all over. In verse 33 it says, When they came to the place called the skull, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on the right and the other on the left. But Jesus was saying, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. I just want to stop right there. The Lord knew what was happening. The Lord knew His circumstances. The Lord knew what evil men were doing. The Lord knew what Satan was trying to do. The Lord knew. But Satan was in victory. Satan was doing his victory dance, his premature victory dance. But Jesus, as He was going to a cross, as He was dying, He was saying, forgive them, Father. They don't know what they are doing. There was salvation happening as He was going to His death. God was at work. The Lord was at work as society thought God was dying. The Messiah was being put out. God was at work. And they cast lots dividing up His garments among themselves. I want to talk very quickly about the people who are at the cross of Jesus Christ. And I want to say this right now. The cross of Jesus Christ still stands. And all of you are standing at the cross of Jesus Christ. All of you. Every Buddhist, every atheist, every, every Muslim, every Jew, every Gentile, everybody is standing at the foot of Jesus right now, at the cross of Jesus Christ right now. He's not on that cross anymore. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not talking about some kind of a Catholic idea where you wear a cross and he's still on that cross. He came off that cross. And that tomb is empty. Now, Catholics, don't be offended. I was raised a devout Catholic. But I'm not talking about religion. I found Jesus many years ago. He found me, actually. And He's not on that cross. But that cross still stands in the wilderness. That cross still stands. And we all gather around that spiritual cross of Christ. Now, there were some soldiers who had been beating Him. Who were beating Him. And they were persecuting him and they were ripping out his beard the Bible says that Jesus was beaten beyond human recognition the passion of Christ does not do Jesus justification the Bible says he was beaten beyond human recognition that you could not tell whether he was a man or a woman you could not tell who he was or what he was his beard had been ripped out as he was laying on the cross he was shamefully naked he was not covered in his private area he was shamefully exposed naked on that cross it, it, it just looked like a red form on a piece of wood. He had no, he had no crime, committed no crime. But people looked at him and they said, this is the one who, who set the, the blind free. This is the one who set the captives free. He's up there now. People were totally dumbfounded by what was happening to Christ. You know, Many people did not understand that the Lord had to go to the, cry, to the cross. Just like Satan could not understand that. He, had Satan known that what Jesus was going to do on that cross, he would have stopped it. Think about that. Had Satan known that salvation was going to come through Jesus dying on that cross, but being raised from the dead, he would have stopped it. He wouldn't have moved in Judas' heart. He wouldn't have moved in all the Gentiles and the Jews to, to bring death upon Jesus. So therefore, a lot of people did not understand. They looked at this Christ, this so-called Christ, this so-called Messiah, and they looked and they said, God is dead. What, what, what is this? They, 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 were, they, they were just flabbergasted. Kind of like us today. When we get Satan to shoot some flaming arrows at us, we can quickly look at Jesus as He's still on that cross dying and say there's no hope. There's no hope. It's all over for me. There are people that gamble the name of Jesus Christ. I'm talking about false preachers. I'm talking about false Christians. These soldiers were at the cross of Jesus Christ and they were gambling for a very expensive piece of shirt that Jesus had, was wearing, that He had worn. It was a seamless shirt. It was woven in one piece. And it was a very expensive piece of shirt. And the soldiers were, were casting lots. that They were you know, gambling to who would get this shirt of Christ. A lot of people come to Jesus gambling away, playing with Christ. Coming to Christ 
for money. It's the prosperity gospel. And a lot of churches preach that today. I'll say he's my savior. I'll say he's my Lord. But it goes on to say there was another kind of people here. Verse 35. Says, and the people stood by, looking on, and even the rulers were sneering at him, saying, He saved others, let him save himself. This is the Christ of God, his chosen one. Today, have mocked the plan of God. Today, many churches have, have just abused. But I do believe that shortly after this presidential elections in the United States of America, I do believe that there will be a spiritual awakening happening in the United States. And I'm not talking about finding your karma or whatever religion you may want. I'm talking about a spiritual awakening to the man Jesus Christ. It's already happening. It's already happening right now. I'm, I'm, I know several pastors who tell me the same thing that is happening in their churches. That all of a sudden people are just coming from the left and the right. People they never even heard of before. And God is just moving all of a sudden. It's happening in this church. But the religious people, they saw Christ and they had fallen into a state of religion. This is what's hurting my heart right now. People who have been in church for so many years... There are some even probably, I hope not, but they may be even in this church. They've been serving Christ for so long, they're spiritually asleep. And they're just so consumed by the, their life and, and the daily activities and what they've got to do that they're not even aware of the spiritual awakening that's happening right now in the church. These religious Pharisees were the ones that were to, to know the Christ, yet they were looking at Him face to face and they were denying him. There was another type of people. The soldiers came and mocked him, coming up to him, offering him sour wine, and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. Now, there was also an inscription above him, This is the king of the Jews. People mock him all the time. Everybody. Nobody is exempt from this. We see this happening right now. Why do you think the name of Jesus is under persecution today in America? They were making fun of the name of Jesus on that cross. They were saying, you know, they put a sign. This is the king of the Jews. This is the king. And today, the same thing. They're making fun of Jesus. We can't pray in the name of Jesus. Oh, Jesus freaks. Jesus, Jesus you know, freaks. This and that. The name of Jesus is coming under persecution once again. It goes on to say... In verse 39, one of the criminals who were there hanging was hurling abuse at him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. I think because I've been involved in prison ministry for a long time, it reminds me of the man who's on the, the, going to his death, in death row, and they're about to inject him with, with that venom, and he's still at the death's door. He, he's defiant. He's still saying, I'm innocent, even though he was guilty. It's the same mentality of this criminal that was on the cross who was dying for his crimes, but yet he was still hurling insults at Christ. There are some people that will go to death very prideful, very arrogant. The only way we're going to know who the real Jesus is is by allowing God to break us. Verse 40 said, but the other, the other criminal answered, rebuking him and saying, not even fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation, and we indeed are suffering justly for what we are receiving, what we deserve for our deeds, but this man has done no wrong. And he was saying, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said to him, truly I say to you today, you shall be with me in paradise. He, he, here's, here's God in the flesh, on the cross, dying, and yet he's granting life. In your hopeless situation, when you think you're about to die, God is willing to grant you life. You're not in the trials and tribulations by yourself. You, you know, you are going through trials, you are going through tribulations, but you're not by yourself. These two men, one was right, one was wrong, but Christ was right in the middle of the whole situation. And you're not alone, Christian. And for you listening by way of video and you're trying to find out who the real God of this world is, it is Jesus Christ. It is Jesus. He is in the middle of it all. And we've got to make a decision. 
We've got to make a decision of, are we going to serve the Lord? Are we going to know the Lord? Are we going to open our heart and our mind to the Lord? But this one criminal, he was so prideful and had such a hard heart towards the King of Kings, the sacrificial Lamb of God. But this other man opened up by faith. And that's how it's got to be. It's got to be by faith. The world is going to tell you so many false lies about the real God of the Bible, about the, who the real Jesus is. But it's going to be by faith. You get your mind and your heart into the Word of God and start applying it and start speaking to the power of the Holy Spirit. Speak to the Holy Spirit and you're going to find who God really is. You're going to find who God really is. It was now about the sixth hour, verse 44, and darkness fell over the whole land until the ninth hour. And because the sun was obscured and the veil of the temple was torn in two. And Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having this, he breathed his last. When the Lord came to his death, it says that darkness covered the whole land. I, I believe, you know, yes, it may have been a physical thing, it's more a spiritual thing also too. Darkness had covered the land. And a lot of times when you are near a spiritual death, even a physical death, de demons are there. Good Christian, now, now I want you to hear something. The Bible says that in the last day, they will be Christians once more. Put them in prison. Revelation, the book of Revelation says this, that the devil will arrest you and put you in prison for 10 days and will test you. But the Bible says, be faithful unto the point of death and I will give you the crown of life. Now my point about this is that even when the Christian comes to death, and, and I believe, and I believe that in America, your constitutional rights will be stripped away one day, the Bible will be outlawed, and every Bible-believing pastor will be put in jail if they ever speak Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life again. That will come to the United States of America very soon. It will come. While many are caught up in, in Dancing with the Stars, an American Idol, Time is coming by so fast. While many are just struggling to pay the light bill, while many are just struggling to raise kids, not realizing that there's a greater plan that God has for you, these times are going to come upon you so quickly. Jesus says, I'll come like a thief in the night, in the twinkle of an eye. But before that happens, darkness will en en develop, uh, en engulf this entire nation in the twinkle of an eye. Yes, it's our right as a Christian to vote, to be effective, in government, to be effective in business, to be effective in our home, to be effective in church life, in every part of society. It's, it's the Christian's responsible right to do that. Knowing that it's going to get worse. Knowing that this is going to be banned eventually in America. Knowing that every right that we have as Americans will want to be abandoned and abolished. It's kind of weird to approach that. Amen? Some people say, well, why pray? Well, well, well why, 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 you know, stand up for the name of Christ if this is all going to happen anyway? Because you are called to be a good steward of the things God has entrusted you with. God's not dead. And the people in the world, the people in America need to hear this. And the only way they're going to hear this is by you, by what you say. And listen, Christian, by the way you live your life. The book of James says, don't be a hearer of the word, be a doer of the word. If you call yourself a Christian, you're going to know how to treat your wife, treat your husband, treat your children, treat those in authority above you, treat your brothers, your sisters, your mothers, your fathers. You're going to know how to act accordingly to bring glory to God in your lifestyle. But we are quickly coming to that time where these things shall happen. Jesus said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. We should know that no matter what we're going through, we can always commit our spirit to the Lord. Who, who, if you were to get, know that if the Lord was to tell you today, by supernatural revelation, that you're going to die this afternoon, and that very well can happen. I can't remember the number, but it's an outrageous number of people that die around the world every day. I think it was like 80,000 or 180,000. Every day. One day, you're going to be a part of that number. Are you ready? Have you met the Lord? Do you know who the real God of heaven and earth is? It goes on to say, in verse 47, Now when the centurion saw what happened, Now hold on, let me say one more thing. I want to miss one more thing. The veil of the temple had torn from top to bottom. 
There was an earthquake when Jesus died. When Jesus died, the spiritual realms shook that it affected the physical realm of this world. And I believe the Holy of Holies, the temple in Jerusalem, that's where the presence of God was before the cross of Christ. And when Jesus died on that cross, the temple of the, of the veil and the temple was torn. The veil of the temple was torn from top to bottom. And, and, and in essence, and, and guys, that this, is, that this is just by knowledge here, the Holy Spirit of God left the Holy of Holies and went out into the hearts of believers at that time. He was ready to be into the hearts of believers at that time. That's what Christ did for us on the cross. That's why we are spirit-filled Christians because until the cross, before the cross, only the priests could go in once a year to bring forth a sacrifice for the, for the sins of Israel once a year. And there had to be a rope tied around that priest because if he wasn't uh, sanctified and clean, he could drop dead of his sins before the presence of the Lord in the Holy of Holies and they had a rope around him to pull him back out because he would drop dead body. And so now, because the blood of Christ was shed on the cross, because he died, the Holy Spirit was now ready to come into the hearts of the people. The temple torn open. There was such a mighty earthquake. Actually, there were two earthquakes. One here at this time and one later when Christ rose from the dead. Three days later. It says right here that Jesus gave up his spirit. And it goes on to say, now when the centurion saw what had happened, he began praising God, saying, certainly this man was innocent. Uh, the other gospels say, this was the Son of God. He was the righteous one. He was the holy one. There, there was a confession of the soldier who was gambling. When they saw the supernatural thing happen, he became a believer. He said, he said certainly this man was innocent. Certainly this man was the Son of God. Sometimes everything in your life has to die. Now listen to me, some of you, this may be setting you free right now. Sometimes everything in your life has to die so that you can find Jesus. And Jesus had to die for this man to know he was the Son of God. And sometimes you have to lose your job. You have to lose all the money in your bank account. Your car is going to have to get repoed. You're going to have to get physically sick. Whatever it may be, for God to get your attention, some of these things are going to have to happen. So that way you can fall on your knees and say, you are the Son of God and I accept you. But we've got to be very careful because demons, they shudder and fear at the presence of Jesus Christ. And je demons confess that Jesus is the Lord. And they believe. But they're still in wrong standing and always will be with God. So it's not just one thing to say, oh, Jesus is Lord. It's one thing to be in awe of Him. And that's one thing that the church is missing today. Being in awe of the cross of Jesus Christ. How do you know that God's not dead? When you're in awe of Jesus. When, how, when, you, when you're in awe of God, you know He's not dead. When you're not suffering and, and compromising with sin and things in your life that you know are wrong, you know God's not dead. Because you're in awe of God. This centurion fell and said, this was an innocent man. I believe that centurion became a believer because of what Jesus said. When he was at the cross, he looked at them all and he said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. The Lord God Almighty always heard the prayer of Jesus Christ. Always, 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 always. So if that's the case, everybody that was at the cross that day got saved. Because Jesus said, Father, forgive them all. And God said, I will forgive them all. When they see that you're not dead. Uh, th this goes back to Jewish historical writings and you may never find this but it's very hard to find but there are some Jewish writers that do teach that Caiaphas became a Christian and if you don't know who Caiaphas is you need to get into your Bible but Caiaphas was, was, was one of the high priests well he was the uh, second in command and Ananias was the high priest and Caiaphas was the one who was really leading the charge of Jesus being uh, murdered but it goes on to say in historical writings that even Caiaphas became a believer. Why? Because Caiaphas was at the cross of Jesus that day. We've got to be very careful, my friend. It is so easy for us to think we love God and know God and find ourselves in wrong standing with God. But God loved him so much. In verse 48 it says, And all the crowds who came together for this spectacle, when they observed what had happened, they began to return and they were beating their breasts. 
But what does that mean, beating their breast? It was in anguish. It was in, you know, in, in may have been in doubt. It may have been in unbelief. But they were beating their breast. They were so upset. They were so hurt. You know, the, the people were saying, this was supposed to be the, the, the Redeemer of Israel. This was supposed to be God Almighty. This was, you know, whatever it may have been. But they were beating their breast because they said, he's dead. He's dead. He's dead. And all his acquaintances and the women who accompanied Jesus from Galilee were standing at a distance seeing these things. All the disciples of Christ, Mary, Mary Magdalene, Lazarus, I believe, Lazarus' sisters, Mary and Martha, all them, they were from a distance and they were looking at Jesus. Dead, bloody, battered, beaten beyond human recognition on that cross. What did they all think? What was going through their heart? What was going through their mind? This was man's greatest hour, I believe. In Luke chapter 24, there's two men. In verse 13, it says, And behold, two of them were going that very day to a village named Emmaus, which was about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about all these things which had taken place, about the death and the burial of Christ. Now, I want you to ask yourself something. If you were alive in those days, how would this have affected your life? See, today we got the whole story. Today we got so many spirit-filled Christian churches and pastors and evangelists in the world bringing forth the pure gospel of Christ. There is a great number of false teachers and there is an apostate church out there. Yes, there is. But the gospel of Jesus Christ is being preached. Somebody could say about it. Is walking the face of the earth today. He is not dead. You're a Christian. You've got to understand something. If you call yourself a Christian, if you confess Jesus as your Lord and Savior, the power of the Holy Spirit is within you. And He can open you up to the things of God Almighty. And, and if that's the case, and if, and if that's true, and if that's the, the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit is going on in you right now, then you should be in awe of God. Constantly. You know, the Bible says in the book of Revelation that the angels, the angels of God, that they, and, and the creatures, the cherubim angels, they fall before the Lord Almighty in, in God's throne. And it says that day and night, this has been for, throughout the ages, thousands upon thousands upon thousands of years, these angels, they fall upon the throne of God. And they say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. These angels are in awe. Why can't we be the same way? These angels have seen. Why? Because they've given attention to their creator. We have more of an advantage, I believe. I really do believe that. We have the Holy Spirit as Christians in us to always be in awe of God. You know, in just the, very, in the last four weeks, there have been 25 people added to this church. God has been moving, but why am I saying that? But why am I saying that? Because people are becoming on awe of God. People are starting to know that God is moving, that He's not dead, that He is alive. These men that were walking, they, they, were, they were believers of God, sort of speak, you know, sort of to a sense, you know. To, they were limited in their knowledge and that they were frustrated, they were sad, and they were just walking away. Verse 16 says, verse 15 says, But while they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself approached and began traveling with them. He says, But their eyes were prevented from recognizing him. I really believe Jesus is not preventing you from recognizing him today. We have not much time left. But there was a reason why Jesus allowed these men, men's eyes to be blinded from him. Because their heart was already blinded. If your heart is blinded, these don't, these in, they're, they're useless. You know, the Bible says we're, to, we're not to worship by what we feel. We worship by what we know. We worship by faith. The Lord kept telling them, I'm going to rise. I'm going to rise. I'm going I'm to, where I go, you cannot go. He was telling them these things. He was, he was forewarning the people of what was going to happen to him. But yet all of them, when he died, they were all without hope. They were all sad. And they were all hurt. And it's just such a great story of how Christ three days later he was witnessed according to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 over 500 people witnessed the living Christ over 500 over 500 
witnessed the living Christ, the resurrected Christ. It goes on to say, And he said to them, What are these words that you are exchanging with one another as you are walking? And they still looked sad. One of them named Cleopas answered and said to him, Are you the only one visiting Jerusalem and unaware of the things which have happened here in these days? And he said to them, What things? And they said to him, The things about Jesus the Nazarene, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word in the sight of God and of the people. And how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. They still looked at Jesus as the Messiah, not the Son of God. They were still saying, Don't you know about Jesus? The Nazarene, he was a prophet. He was mighty. He's dead. They still had a measure of unbelief in their heart that Jesus was the Messiah. That he was the anointed one, the righteous one. The living God. God in the flesh. Here's, you know, it's kind of like today, guys. We have these two men that were on the road to MMAs. We got these kind of people in the church all the time. They'll come to the Bible studies. They'll learn and they'll read and they sing the songs and they're just, they got a mediocre heart. They'll come, you know, every now and then. But see, they, they really never understand who God, who Jesus really is. It never really penetrates the heart, the mind, the body, the soul. It never really does. They continue to live the same sinful life. Unbelief. Do, and now I want you to ask yourself, is unbelief sin? Yes, it is. If you do not believe in the Son of God, it is sin. These men were unbelief. They couldn't recognize who Jesus was. To them, He was just a prophet, and He was dead, and He was gone. However long they had been seeing Jesus walk the face of the earth, they had missed the whole point. That's why Jesus came to these two. There's so many people that will come to the church, and so many people today that will come to the church, and they'll want to have a, a form of godliness, but they just don't get it. They're not in awe of God. Their heart is still closed and is still open to the things of the world. There are so many things in America that we can be distracted by. So many things. Satan will come to you in the form of your career. In the form of raising up your kids. You know, last night, Friday and Saturday nights, people are out here in this ballpark playing with their little league kids, baseball, playing until 10.30 at night. But they can't get them up to church on Sunday morning. And then we're going to ask ourselves, why are our kids shooting each other in school? Why? Why is it that society in America has just gone straight to hell? Because we're caught up in an idolatry mentality. It's about us, us, us. How do we please ourselves? We know what our favorite TV shows are, what our favorite music is, but yet we can't even understand what one small scripture is trying to say to us in the Bible. And I'm not talking about unbelievers. I'm talking about people who have been coming to church. One, one thing that as a pastor I'm starting to see, people who have been in the church, not just this church alone, but, but many, many, and I'm in agreement with a lot of pastors. And, and you listening to my video, please listen to me. One thing that has been in discussion among pastor circles is Christians who have been in the church for so long, so-called elders, their hearts are becoming cold. And they're turning to a form of religion. We're seeing that happen. And also we're starting to see people that have never knew Jesus start to come now. We're seeing something happen. Let not that be you, Christian. Let not that be you. God is alive. He's not dead. He's not dead. He's not dead. In verse 19 he says... He said, what things? And then, you know, verse 20, they go on to say how the chief priest killed him and crucified him. Verse 21 says, but we hope, we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, besides all this, it is the third day since these things have happened. But also some women among, among us amazed us when they were at the tomb early this morning and they did not find the body. They came saying that he had also, they had also seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. And some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just exactly as the women also had found it. But they did not see him there. They didn't see him. And he said to them, O foolish men, and slow of heart to believe in all of the prophets who have spoken. 
Was it not necessary for the Christ to suffer these things and to enter into his glory? In the beginning with Moses and with all the prophets, he explained to them the things concerning himself and all the scripture. You know, we have to go, if we have to be in awe of God, and if we, look, if we have to understand that God is alive, if one thing we may have to do, if we're stuck in a, in a state of, of staleness right now, Christian, and we need to, we may have to start all over. We may have to go back to the beginning of the Bible. Start reading the Bible all over again. Start all over again with, with everything. Everything that you thought you knew about God. You know, wipe it out and start on the foundation of Jesus Christ. He had to take these two men. These men, they were stuck in unbelief. The, 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 the prophet Jesus, they thought, was dead. They were, they were still clueless to the plan of God. There are many people like that in this world. And you know what the Lord had to do? He had to start all over with them. He took them back to the Old Testament. And He reminded them of everything. And He had to build them back up spiritually. He had to build them back up to the, from the very beginning to where they were on the road at that moment. It goes on to say here, as they approached the village where they were going, he acted as though they, he was going further. But they urged him, saying, Stay with us for now, for it is getting toward evening, and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. You know, the Lord will come to you. He will come to you. He'll give you some kind of a knowledge. And that knowledge may give birth to wisdom. But the Lord will come to you. And, and li please listen to me. But there's got to be a point in your life where you have to ask Him, invite Him into your life, into your house, into your mind into your heart, into your mouth, into your hands. You've got to ask Him, can, can you come with me? You know, I, I think of Zacchaeus the tax collector. He was sick and tired of being an evil man. He was a very rich man. He had all the money everybody could want. He was a very rich tax collector. He was a chief tax collector. But when he heard that Jesus was coming to his town, he climbed up a tree just to get a vision of Jesus. And Jesus, he got Jesus' attention. And Jesus looked at him and said, Zacchaeus, I must go to your house. And so he took Jesus into his house. And that day, after a meal, this man got saved. This man became in awe of who God was. He was no longer an unbeliever, but he was now a son of the Most High God. We've got to ask Jesus to come into our lives. He's not dead. He's alive. He will transform. If you allow, if you allow him, if you allow Jesus, and, 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 and please hear me, if you will allow Jesus, he will change your world upside down right now. And that's a good thing. That's a good thing. Because right now you got every kind of enemy in the book outside in society of America pulling at the Christian, the young Christian, the old Christian, pulling at you to get you away from the plan of God. They're trying to tell you God's not dead. They're trying to tell you God's not important. They're trying to tell you that what we do as a church is not important. It don't really mean nothing. Why are you going to prayer services? You know, you don't see any results. Jesus said that when we go through these things, stand still and lift up your head for your redemption is drawing near. The Bible says that they will call good evil and evil good. And that the love of many shall grow cold. And because of this, they will kill, steal, and murder everyone. They will take the traits of Satan, their father. And murder will be abounding greatly in this nation. It's happening before our very eyes. Before our very eyes, it is happening. People, the message in America is, is going out and saying God's not dead. In a certain political party at their convention this year, they had to ask three times about allowing God to be on the platform. Three times, and they still had 50 50 uh, voting on that. My friend. I'm not a prophet, but I tell you in authority of the Word of God, and my wife is in agreement with me because she, this was something that has put on her heart, was confirmed in mine. Shortly after the presidential elections, there will be a spiritual awakening happen in the United States of America. People, the hearts will be turned to Jesus. They, they will be turned to Jesus. People that you never thought would accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior are going to come home. It's going to happen. But there's a downside to all of that. We see people in the church that have been in the church for so long. 
Their hearts are becoming cold. They're turning to a form of religion. They don't want to stay and grow up the young ones that are coming in. We're seeing that happen. And this has got to be addressed in the church. And this has to be dealt with today. Jesus said, I will go into your house. In verse 30, it goes, when he reclined at the table with them, he took the bread and blessed it and broke it. And he began giving it to them. And their eyes were open and they recognized him and he vanished from their sight. When Jesus comes into your house, spiritually, when Jesus comes into your house, he will feed you. He will feed you. He will provide your every need. And your eyes will be opened. Amen. 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 When He meets your every need. When, you're, when, when He says here, Jesus said, I'm the bread of life. Come to me. Eat my flesh. They thought He was nuts. Jesus said, drink my blood and you'll live. And they're like, what? Are you serious? He's blasphemy. You know, the priests were ripping their, their, their big shred, uh, clothes to shreds. And they were like, this guy's nuts. He's caused himself the Son of God. He's, a, he's the prince of demons. And you see what makes sense to the Christian ain't going to make sense to the world. Please hear me on that. God is not dead. You're here for a reason today. Because God is stirring in your heart. Because you know that He's not dead. You know He's alive. My prayer is that some of you, you, some of you may see the throne of God tonight. I don't know. I've known several people who died in the prime of their life. They were cut down. In the prime of their lives, some were ready to meet God and some were not. But this I do know on the authority of the Word of God. We will all one day leave this world. And are we ready to meet Jesus? Have we accepted Jesus as our Lord and Savior? And it's more than getting a tattoo of Jesus on your arm or on your back or wearing a gold chain with Jesus on the cross. It's, that, that is not a relationship with Christ. He looks at the heart. He's looking at the mind. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth shall speak. If, if we're saying, you know, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian, yet yeah, our mouth is filled with perverse language, we are deceiving ourselves and we're cutting ourselves short. And we're giving in to the enemy and we're saying in a sense, yes, God is dead. But if, if, if Jesus is your Lord and He is your Savior, He's going to transform you because you're no longer of this world. Jesus stood before Pilate as they were trying to accuse him of, of, of blasphemy. And Pilate asked him, are you a king? And Jesus says, yes, it is true, I am a king. But my kingdom is not of this world. Jesus was saying, I'm just passing through here. And as a Christian, we're just, when we become Christians, we're just passing through here. We brought nothing into this world. We'll take nothing out. There ain't nothing free in this world but the blood of Jesus Christ. And the blood of Jesus Christ is all that we need to make us right in the eyes of God. To be in awe consistently of God. My, my prayer is that the Christian would be in awe of the maker of heaven and earth. There's got to come a point in our time in a Christian's life for today where we got to say, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. Yeah. I'm tired of believing the lies of Satan. I'm tired of believing the lies and the plans and the tricks of the devil. I'm tired of that. God has given you mind and a heart to open up the Word of God for yourself yeah. and not have some pope or bishop or some dictator to interpret to you what the Word of God says. He will give you the Holy Spirit. He'll put you in a Bible-believing church. He'll align you up with some Christians who love Jesus. And you'll know beyond a shadow of a doubt that God is not dead. Amen. Because your life will be transformed. These men, they sat down and they ate with Jesus. And they said, Jesus! I mean, they, they, they were shocked. They heard that He might have rose from the dead. But they knew when they ate of the bread that Jesus had gave to them. Their eyes were opened. We need to eat from the hand of Jesus. Oh, you, if you're a Christian, you're, the, you're, you're a lamb. You're a sheep of Jesus Christ. You're his sheep. And you need to come to the shepherd, the hand of the shepherd. And you need to eat of the shepherd's hand. So that you can live. So that you can see. So that you can be and go and do what God called you to do. Some of you have plans to go eat today after church neglecting the real food that you need. This church service, when it's over, it cannot just end here. You've got to make some hard decisions about your life because God is going to call it in one day soon. 
And nobody can stand before the throne of God and say, but this or but that. You know, Christian, you know. And the Lord loves you so much with a passion. He is throwing every avenue at you to bring you forth into his presence so that you would be in awe of him and so you could stand up in a dark, perverted, polluted world that is quickly going to hell so that you can stand up and say, my God is not dead. And you will show that by the way you live your life and the decisions that you made in your life. We've all messed up. We've all sinned. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. But the story does not end there. It does not end there. I've grabbed hands with men who have murdered women and little babies and they've set their bodies on fire. I've talked to people like that. And Jesus loves them because their hearts were turned to the Lord. I've seen men walk the streets acting all big and bad and mighty and macho, but when they get a taste of Satan and they get put in jail, they become little babies. I've seen what Satan can do. And it is not pretty. I've seen a man in a prison cell doing this to the guards. Come on! And there's big seven guards ready to take him down because he's just not cooperating with the authorities. That's what Satan wants in your life. Satan wants you to just look at the authority, God Almighty, and Satan just wants you to say, come on, God, let's go. God will have his way. He loves you. Oh, he loves you. 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 They said one another, were our not hearts burning within us while he was speaking to us on the road and while he was explaining the scripture to us? Were our not hearts not burning? Were our hearts not burning? Receive that in Jesus' name.